yourself virtuous if you have not overcome your own greatest weaknesses. And this will start to sound like comments that we made when we were studying with Franklin, doesn't it? The idea of that thing in your neck, your own personal weaknesses, your own struggles. It is so easy to look past our own struggles to others' struggles and somehow begin to think that we are superior to them. Penn says, any cautions against it? Don't do that. Instead, know yourself. What are your weaknesses? What are the things you should be working on? And go to work on those things. How many ball clubs would be so much better if each of the ball players as a part of the team would say, I'm not worrying about judging all of the other people on my team. I'm worrying about improving myself and in the process helping the team to grow. If every person on the team did that, we would have a compelling championship bound team, wouldn't we? Think about it. Of course, in society, it works the same way, doesn't it? I like the fact that some of the advice that we have in, so, in Fruits of Solitude uh, work very well for people who are responsible as teachers. For example, I'll just give this one. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I often, if I talk to teachers, I will make this observation from Penn. He says it in his, uh, in his treatment. The humble and true teacher meets with more than he expects. What a great line. And, of course, all of you will be teachers at some point in your life. You already are. I mean, those of you, for example, who are coaching little kids' soccer or volleyball, you already know that you end up being a certain kind of leader or teacher. Always, you learn more if you are humble. Of course, Walt Whitman will say this in passage 46, 47 of Song of Myself as, destroy the teacher. In other words, be better than the teacher. And a teacher should hope that students would be, be more, be better, destroy the teacher. Not in a violent way, but of course in a creative, imaginative way. Uh, the, the religious man, Penn, as a Quaker, makes an interesting observation about what sometimes is the case in regards to how people perceive the whole notion of religion and religious practice. He says it's better to be of no church than to be bitter for any. It's an interesting observation. In other words, if you have negative views towards a certain kind of religious practice, it's probably better to not have that religious practice. It's an interesting idea stated by a devoutly religious person. Of course, the challenge here is you better live your theology more than argue your theology. And of course, that distinction we sometimes use in everyday parlance as the distinction between being religious and practice a certain kind of religious practice and being spiritual, you actually follow through the precepts of the teachings of whatever religion it is you practice. He continues with this idea, and he makes this ready to say it this way, we are too ready to retaliate rather than forgive or gain by love and information. Wow, what an amazing line. Think about someone does us wrong, someone is inappropriate to us, treats us badly, our first instincts are always jack them back. Instead of thinking about, why are they treating me this way? Maybe they need love as opposed to hate. It's a compelling idea. In the second part of uh, More Fruits of Solitude, the second part, um, um, we, there's, a, there's a couple of passages that I as well love to kind of share, um, share with students. Let me, let me share these with you in conclusion here as we kind of finish up our observations about um, some of the advice that is, uh, that is given here. Um, always remember, he says this, always remember to bound thy thoughts to the present occasion. We have a tendency to live in one of two places, as we've said before in 303. We have a tendency to live in the past, always thinking about what we you know, have, a, have done or haven't done, constantly worrying or thinking about the past. We have a tendency to always be thinking about the future, the future, the future, and what's coming, what's coming. And it's like we've said sometimes in 303 to seniors. It's a weird thing that you can finish 12 years of school and you have very little memory of ever being in the present, in the now, in the occasion. We're always thinking about something else. Of course, this is as well understood as what we have talked about in regards to energy conservation model. Imagine, for example, that our psychic energy in the morning 
uh, when we wake up is like a, a milk carton full of milk and as we go through our day with all kinds of challenges, it's like somebody popping a pick ice pick in the, in the side of our milk carton and we start bleeding all kinds of milk energy by the end of our day. Oh my goodness, we're so tired. Observation, why not begin to pay attention to the ways we lose energy? Because there's only two kinds of energy loss. Stuff I can control, stuff I can't control. Stuff I can control, I should control. Stuff I can't control, I gotta let it go. I can't control it. There's no point in it fixating and worrying about it. In other words, working to try and stay in this moment. Of course, the other word picture that we work with in 303 that we've mentioned regularly is, of course, monkey mind. The idea that our minds are kind of like a caged monkey, a, a, a cage of, of iron with a fire underneath, and every time that poor monkey touches that bar, he just gets scalded, burned, and of course, he's shrieking and he's jumping all over the place with oh, you know, hornets or bees stinging him as well. It seems to be our mind all over the place. Notice how even during our conversation right now, right, right, we smile. Notice how right now even, it's so hard to sit up and pay attention. Monkey mind. Of course, the conquer monkey mind is one of the great pieces of advice, counsel, that will be given in Fruits of Solitude. You've got to overcome this inability to focus. And of course, that begins by, first of all, just identifying the ways in which we lose our concentration. If you're a ball player at practice, just stand back and watch while the coach is talking and identify the ways in which nobody is really listening. And then, of course, the first question is always do. What are we supposed to be doing anyway? Of course, if you can see it, if you can identify it, you can begin to, as we say, free that monkey. That is to say, begin to have some concentration. That takes a lot of practice. I had a mother who argued her son cannot do it. I said, it's not true. No, no, you don't understand. I said, watch him at home if he plays video games. When he plays video games, he's totally focused. Right, that is right. In other words, he's in the moment because he is interested. So the challenge, of course, is can you find interest in the things that you have to do, not that you love to do, that you have to do, like, for example, for many of us schooling. Can you do that? Conquer. Conquer that mind. He continues in the second part with a really compelling idea as well about the ways in which we have a tendency to want to be praised. He says it, be not fond of praise, but seek virtue that leads to it. In other words, don't always be looking to be named the superstar, the best. Don't always be looking for somebody to pat you on the back and give you that praise as we were saying a few moments ago or to quote a really famous NFL football coach, do your job. Of course, let's be fair, all coaches say do your job. The challenge, of course, is for ball players to internalize the idea and say, I will do my job and I'll be aware when I'm not doing my job and I'll hold myself accountable. That idea of holding yourself accountable, 3A observation, shouldn't be surprising. That's, of course, Ben Franklin's idea as well of moral perfection. Hold yourself accountable. In other words, to use a word picture we shared before, take off your own training wheels. Don't wait for somebody to do it for you. Hmm. Um, he makes another observation as well. It's safer to learn than teach. And who conceals his opinion has nothing to answer for. This is a compelling idea. One of the most interesting things, I, get, I love to talk with teachers because they will point out, especially young teachers will point out to me, I'm just blown away by how much I'm learning while I'm teaching the material that I'm teaching. If you've ever shared information with somebody that they don't know and you've shared it with them, you know that you know that information so much better after you get to share it. It's a compelling reason to teach, by the way. It's an enjoyable reason to teach. At the very end of uh, part two, we are met as well with some observations about the fly swatter. As we have said, the only real difference between you and a fly is you know about fly swatters. And as we've said, that's no throwaway line. The fact that when you were a child and they told you you couldn't swing at the park forever, but you had to go to the van, they were already teaching you. You ain't met no 200-year-old people. Which means that, of course, death is coming, and we know that. But about death, Penn has an interesting observation. Watch this one. He says it this way. Death cannot kill what never dies. Oh, now of course we're going to pick up with this when we study our, our, our Plato's Phaedo. This will be a text of the second volume of the Harvard Classics. 
But one of the more interesting things that we'll say about this is, if you are energy, the last time I checked you are, and energy is that which can be neither what? You're right, created or destroyed. Well then what is death? Because certainly it's not the destruction of energy, because energy can't be destroyed. Well then what is death? Again, to go back to the line, he says it, death cannot kill what never dies. The belief in the soul or the spirit is obviously one of the interpretations of this. But even if you don't believe in that, well, what about energy? Because that's what you are. It's a compelling idea. Finally, one more time, we meet this idea of the Puritan work ethic, as it sometimes in the past has been referred to. I'll just give you one more example of how that one, under, how, um, how that one is understood in this text. He that neglects his work robs his master or his boss, since he is fed and paid as if he did his best. Now this is a compelling idea. We mentioned this in another three observation earlier in that compelling autobiography up from slavery of Booker T. Washington. Given the duty of sweeping the floor, doesn't, does, doesn't just do it once. He does it once and then he says, I think I can do it better. Challenging ourselves to be better. Think about the last time you had a job. You were given a job to do. As soon as you finished that job, you stopped. You set out. Why didn't you look around and ask, what more can be done? The job I just did, can I do it better? Why is it that we are lazy? Now, I'm not insulting. Please, I'm not. Think about this. Why are we lazy? Why are we so quick to finish the job and then sit down? We're not doing anything, but we want to rest. Penn and the Puritan work ethic says, don't rest, work. Enjoy work. Enjoy, if you're an athlete, training. Enjoy it. Find the benefit in it. And, of course, grow through finding the benefit in it. That's that evolution, of course, that we spoke about before in moral evolution, where we move from egocentric to ethnocentric to world-centric and finally to some kind of integralist perspective. All right, well, let's finish. This has, of course, been some compelling advice. Let's listen at two ways of possible messages, themes here. Obviously, one, self-improvement. Of course, another one is this idea of self-discipline. Energy conservation, the idea of the Puritan work ethic. The challenge here, and again, it's a stinging challenge. I realize that for some of us, we kind of hear it and we go, well, this is kind of almost like uh, meddling in my affairs, dude. And I say to you, how about this? Why don't you just study your life and ask, can I be more focused, more disciplined? Can I be less lazy? Can I do a job but do it well? Can I demand of myself that I do jobs well? And if I can't demand that, maybe I lack our third message here. Maybe I lack some courage that I need to find. The idea of it takes some real courage, it takes some honesty, and of course courage to admit, I got issues and I need to listen to some good advice. Speaking of good advice, let's now turn to 2B really quickly, that rhetorical uh, level. Notice how Penn in this text can provide powerful wisdom in very short little sayings. They're not long. He hasn't written a novel. He just gives us a little bit to think about. And in that, we can kind of hear what he has to say and then walk away and think about it for a while. Good advice coming from the old to the young. Of course, this is a challenge to us because our instincts are when some old fart starts talking to just shut down. Oh, no, here we go. Of course, it is interesting to ask. We, as already later in high school, we are prepared at times to give advice to those who are younger. I mean, I just heard a senior the other day talking about a sixth grader. Oh, it was just painful, painful. I wanted to tell the sixth grader, why didn't you shut up and look? Oh, yeah. We have a tendency to not want to listen to the people who are older than us telling us, no, no, I know third grade math is hard for you, but there's stuff called calculus that's coming. Whoa, we don't want to hear it, do we? Hmm. At 3A, and observations to other texts, of course, we immediately have to accept the fact that when we are studying the great books, the classics, we are, in many ways, studying texts of advice. Not always advice we're going to agree with, not even always advice that we will necessarily find to be true, but nonetheless advice. Think about, for example, Machiavelli's Prince, a text that we've spoken of before in 303. Here we have advice from Machiavelli to a would-be prince or leader. 
Of course, think about Thoreau's Walden. His capacity to write for himself ultimately, though, becomes advice to us to learn, for example, to reawaken and to keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn. Wow, what a great line. Can we have that infinite expectation of the dawn? Think about how many of the texts we are studying are about advice. We're, we're about to turn to volume two of the Harvard Classics and we'll meet Socrates, the great teacher, and of course Plato, his student, that write these amazing dialogues. One of the texts that we've already studied together in, in Plato's Republic, remember those opening lines? Do you remember that observation by the young person to Socrates? How can we hear if we refuse to listen? Hmm. The challenge, of course, is to internalize advice to hear what someone has said to us and to actually listen. Listen with our whole mind and try to put it into practice. That's compelling. Now, of course, we can, as well at 3A, make some observations already made that Franklin and Woolman are the other two individuals who are represented in Volume 1 of Harvard Classics and with good cause now Penn joins them. Notice how all of them are giving us this um, guidance to some really powerful kinds of advice. And in all three offerings, we have some things that challenge us. Right. Of course, as well, let's point out that these three titles all tell us something about the importance of religion in early American thought and the distinction between religious practice and spiritual understanding. They don't always go together. Finally, in 3B, let's ask a few questions to finish. How well, be honest, how well do you take advice? If somebody, for example, gives you advice, are your first instincts to say, oh, dude, really, just, I don't want to hear it. Or is your first instinct to say, I want to hear what you have to say to me, even if I don't agree, I'm going to try and listen to the advice that's given. Of course, this study will uh, explain to us why virtue and values really matter. We have to, have, think about this. I said this earlier in, in an early lecture. We have to have a high bar. Don't we? I mean, we don't want a low bar. I mean, what kind of coach would you play for who said, uh, we're, we're not even going to be 500. We got no chance of ever being 500. And frankly, I don't even care if you come to practice because what difference does it make? You would say about a coach like that, no, 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 that's a loser approach. We have to have a high bar. Think about this. If we're going to have any optimism in our life, we have to wake up in the morning and demand of ourselves, I'm going to be better than I was the day before. Immediately, of course, we think of Longfellow's Psalm of Life, a lecture we've already given, right? When he says in Psalm of Life that, that we have to think about at the end of every day, did I do it just a little better than the day before? Try to be better. Challenge yourself to be better. Of course, I was just speaking about Longfellow's Psalm of Life. You'll remember that passage, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us Footprints on the sands of time, footprints that perhaps another sailing our life solemn and a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. In other words, live a life that you are proud of. Live a life that you will say to sixth graders, emulate my life. Live the kind of life that I live. Not imitate, emulate. The kind of choices that I make that are rooted in a certain value system that's a value system of respect and courage and honesty, integrity. And if you're not living that life, you have to admit that about yourself. And you have to take a hard look at yourself in that mirror and say, I need to be better. I really do. Because it matters to me. Of course, by extension, it matters to your country. You have to be a citizen. And what does it mean to be a citizen? To realize they're always watching the younger. And they will become what they are because of what they've seen in and your generation. That is a heavy weight to bear. And I want to make sure that it's laid firmly on your shoulders. You need to hear that. That's exactly what Penn is saying. If you don't work hard, the younger generation will not learn to work hard. And what kind of a nation do we have if we don't have hard workers? I know a nation that lacks imagination, creativity, a nation that lacks honor, respect, courage, integrity. And of course, those cardinal virtues of Plato that we'll be talking about here in a while, wisdom, courage, temperance, discipline, and of course, justice. Finally, think about the advice that maybe you would give to somebody who's younger. The counsel that maybe you would give, for example, to a freshman 
as a senior, you might say, let me tell you one or two things about how to survive this experience of high school. Begin to formulate the kind of advice that someday you think you will want to give to a young person. And at the same time, pay attention to the advice that you can gain through texts, both in reading and watching. In other words, go to work. Thank you.